Hi, everyone, and welcome to Double Take, a podcast about the media from the Centre for Media Transition at UTS. Welcome also to the Year in Media Transition, which is something we do annually. I'm Sasha Molitoris. I'm an academic at UTS Law. Before that, I used to work as a journalist at the Sydney Morning Herald. I'm recording today on the ancestral lands of the Bidjigal and Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, so I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past and present, and to acknowledge them as traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. This land was never ceded. So as I say, today's panel is a year in media transition event. It's the third edition. And the topic today is Australia's news media bargaining code. Early next year, Australia's world first code turns three, meaning that many of the deals Google and Meta have done with Australian news media businesses are about to expire. Worth well over $200 million annually, these deals have prompted a host of other jurisdictions to follow suit. Yet critics argue the code is flawed, unfair, and lacks transparency. So today we ask, is the code a new savior or is it a platform shakedown? We have three formidable, fantastic guests today. I'm really excited about this. We have former ACCC chair, Rod Sims, who can fairly be described as the code's architect. We have Columbia journalism scholar Anya Schifrin, whose recent research has put a dollar figure on the value of news to digital platforms. And we have author and consultant Hal Crawford, who has a vast range of expertise, international expertise from newsrooms to startups. And before we get going, I want to note also that I did reach out to Google and Meta to be on the panel, but they declined. I also asked Digi, um, who represent digital platforms, they said they don't talk uh, to competition issues. So let's get going. Rod, let me throw this to you, first of all, straight away. News Media Bargaining Code, it's been in effect for nearly three years. Has it been a success? I think by any standard, it's been a success. Um, for example, if you were to ask what, what we were hoping for when the code was implemented and compare that to what we've got, we'd have thought that was a complete success. I and mean, the objective was to even up the bargaining power to get commercial deals done between media organisations and Google and Facebook. We got those commercial negotiations. Um, the media companies were happy with the outcome. Uh, we've got over 200 million, may well be closer to 250 million a year. We saw an uptick in job ads for journalists increased by 46%. Uh, we saw the Guardian increase their hiring by about 50%. So it's it achieved everything we wanted it to. So I, I can't think uh, why it couldn't be labelled anything other than a success. Yeah, right. So, and, and following on from that, before I, I ask the same question of the others, do you think it's been fair, which is a really big, big issue, of course? Well, I don't see under what heading you'd say that it wasn't. I've never really understood that. Um, some people said, well, most of the money went to the major media companies. Well, of course, this is about paying for content that you're using. Most of the content comes from the bigger media companies. So I just don't see how else anybody would expect it to operate. What I do observe and have observed is that the amount the smaller media companies got per journalist employed was likely larger than the larger media companies got per journalist employed. So they certainly weren't done down. They certainly got their fair share. So I, I don't really understand why it wasn't fair. I mean, this isn't a, we're not talking about a government grant program here uh, where you could have a range of objectives. We're talking about facilitating commercial negotiation. We did that. It happened. I think we got commercial outcomes and just about everybody who should have got a deal, at least from Google, did get a deal. And the smaller players, Country Press Australia, for example, which is, I think it's 180 publications, over 60 owners, very small, some of them, they got an excellent deal and they were very, very happy with it. Thank you. Yeah. So, Anya, you've got a, a different perspective, uh, not necessarily a different viewpoint, but a different um, perspective necessarily being overseas. 
Um, what do you think about those questions from what you, you've seen and read in your own research? Do you think it's been a success in Australia and do you think it's been fair? Um, obviously, I'm not in Australia, but yes, I do. And I think one of the really important points about the code was that it got Google and to some extent Meta to pay up when nobody else had been able to do that. In, around the world, publishers have been trying for years to get payments and they couldn't. And I think that I, I was just talking to someone in Germany who told me it took them 10 years to start getting payouts. They've just started getting them in November. So I think getting money out of those companies was incredibly important. I think that what Australia did inspired um, other countries and publishers around the world to get money. So I think it was actually really important. Yeah. Mm, great. Look, we'll come back to some of the research that you've done recently that put a specific dollar figure on the value of news. Um, and we'll come back to other jurisdictions as well. Um, but Hal, I just wanted to get your initial impressions on those big questions, you know, those initial questions. What do you think about the success or, or otherwise, and the fairness or otherwise of the code? Yeah, um, look, it's it's fascinating to be here discussing this. I'll just say, especially with Rod, uh, and Anya seems to know a hell of a lot about this, Um so for me, this is a wonderful opportunity because I've been effectively a spectator to the process while Rod has actually been doing it. Um, and I always respect people who do things rather than talk about things. So I just say that straight up because my um, viewpoint does actually differ quite um, <laughs> considerably. Um, and look, I think the bargaining code has seen a great deal of money flow into news in Australia and um, that's had a positive impact. There's no doubt about that. Um, and that money wouldn't have been there otherwise. So look, I think that's great because um, I am for that. But I do think that um, the way that the money is raised matters. Um, and I think that for ethical reasons, but also for practical reasons. Um, I don't think the reasoning behind the code is sound. Um, and I think because of that, um, the unsoundness of the reasoning, I think that it's going to end up being quite short term um, rather than a long term, um, not fixed. I don't think we can say fix for news. I don't think Rod was aiming for that. I don't think anyone was saying there was going to be a fix for news here. But it would have been nice to have a long term revenue stream coming into news. And I don't think that is going to be the case. Um, and possibly, well, definitely, in my opinion, the reason that that is not the case is because I don't think the code makes sense. Do you care to elaborate on that? Do you, do you have an alternative? Um, or, or, yeah, It's quite, um, so I, I guess my argument here is that if the code had been done to redress a market imbalance, uh, so there, there definitely is a market imbalance. There's no question about that. I, I don't, um, and in, in this argument, I definitely don't take the part of the platforms. I'm not actually interested in their point of view, um, except where I think that it's correct. So I think the, I think if all, what we had in the, in the code of the way it's operating in Australia, I think if it had successfully redressed a market imbalance, I believe what we would see is that the parties would grumble, yes, but they would get on with it. I think that if what we saw was a a more or less fair exchange value value exchange, then we would have uh, Google and Meta looking to continue those um, deals in some form. And um, rather, I see that Meta has already walked away from news, um, and I don't think we're going to see any renewals there. And I think Google is cynically continuing to pay for the news as a kind of a political cost that it has rationalized internally. And I don't think they have any real commitment to their investment. Okay, inter interesting. And so you used the word unethical. Um, is is the heart of your concern a lack of transparency or, or is it a bunch of things? Um, yeah, I actually, look, the use of the term unethical is one that I 
that I'm careful in use. I should have been more careful before I said it, but I've said it now. I don't mean to imply that the architects of this uh, code are unethical or, in fact, the impact of the code is unethical. I, I'm very much a realist. Uh, I think we've already heard in what Rod said um, that there has been a real impact here, a real positive impact. Great. Um, I don't think that the ends justify the means. Let's just say that. I think that... Um, would I like to see Google and Meta paying more to support the societies in which they operate? Yes, I think that is absolutely essential. Um, it seems to me that the code is uh, a de facto um, tax or excise um, designed to kind of raise a subsidy and that subsidy is then being distributed to these companies. I think that it would have um, been better and maybe a more long-term solution if we had have recognized that outright yes very difficult um the way the situation is going in canada looks to me like it's kind of devolving into a de facto subsidy so uh yeah i, I would have preferred to see us pursuing that path thanks Albert. um what are your thoughts on on house objections um I don't see why it's short term. I think the I think Google will uh, continue with the deals. The legislation's in place. It's not going anywhere. There's no push to repeal it. The deals will fall due possibly as soon as next year. I'm I'm not sure a bit out of it now. I can't see any reason why Google wouldn't review those deal, renew those deals. They need news. You can't really run a search engine without news. So it's appropriate that they pay for it. I think they recognise that. Uh, they've done a deal in Canada, which means they're going to pay for news there. Meta, of course, is a different story. But I just don't see why this isn't long-term. Mm. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, we've we got commercial deals here. They were done with massive negotiation over a long period of time where the players were certainly accommodating each other. So I'm not... To be honest, really not sure what hell is wanting as the alternative. Uh, was it? Yeah, I, 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 so I don't understand the alternative, I'm afraid. Yeah, I, I guess there's the alternative that um, is mentioned sometimes, which Harold came to um, briefly, something like a, a tax. You know, you, you, you set a levy on big digital platforms that is for public interest journalism, say, um, which is an ex a very different mechanism um, than the code and not something... That the ACCC would impose, except that a, a Google and Meta have got to meet their tax obligations, and mm. there's obviously issues around that. Once they've met their tax obligations, I'm not sure what the obligation beyond meeting their tax tax obligations are. Mm. If you impose a tax, how do you distribute the money? How do you determine what the right size of the tax is? What we had here was a commercial negotiation. Yes, the parties were forced into it, but ultimately they could have gone to arbitration if they were very upset with the outcome. So you got an outcome that both sides could live with. Therefore, you got about the right amount of money. Now, I know Anya's done research, which suggests perhaps the money isn't as large as it could have been, but we'll come to that. Mm. But I think the government otherwise would have been flying blind and would have been allocating money on an arbitrary basis, and you wouldn't have got the accommodations that you inevitably got in a commercial negotiation. We were wanting a commercial negotiation. We got one. We're very happy with that. Great. Well, transparency is an issue. You know, it's something that I mentioned um, just a few moments ago. So transparency, transparency is an issue that is significant for some people. Rod, I've heard you say that um, uh, there shouldn't be transparency transparency here, these are commercial deals. Um, but of course, on the flip side, you have people saying, well, it doesn't really help these news media businesses when they're bargaining, if they're going in blind and they don't know what other news media businesses have uh, made in terms of deals. But also for the public, we don't get to see, or even the government, we don't get to see enough where the money has gone, what the money is, what the other compensation is. Uh, or consideration and where where it's gone exactly has it gone to public interest journalism? Um, 
So Rod, did you want to respond to, to the issue of transparency specifically? As you imply, I don't really have much sympathy for it. This is a these were commercial negotiations. The objective was to get commercial negotiations where we couldn't get them before. Had you had commercial negotiations without the need for the bargaining code, then the public wouldn't have known anything about the deals either. We made an explicit decision that we did not want commercial deals made public. I'm sure not only Google and Facebook wouldn't want that, but I'm absolutely certain the media companies wouldn't want that either. I mean, they have negotiated something. They're happy with it. It involves things that are commercial in confidence to them in terms of what they've placed value on, what they haven't. I think it's their commercial business, not the public's interest here. The only issue I've had sympathy for is that perhaps having the ability, a government entity gathering up the information and in aggregate saying what the amounts were would be helpful because the only way we all know what the amounts were on this call is because the ACCC rang around all the chief executives, added it up, and I told the world what the number was. <laughs> um, people have to hope that we got accurate information and we did the addition correctly. I, I accept that's probably not the right way to do it. And the Canadians have gone a different way where you get a central body that lets people know what the total amount is. I think if you knew the total amount, that would give good guidance to people to work out what their fair share of that total amount is. Because people roughly know how many journalists they are, know uh, are in existence. They know what their number of journalists are. I think that so that, that level of transparency I'd be in favour of. Anya, do you have any thoughts about that issue? You actually want to come back also to the question of what would have been better. I mean, I think the problem is that these companies, especially Google, are so big and powerful that they don't really want, you know, if there's a better option than the codes, I'm all ears. But in fact, you know, they're tax avoiders. They take advantage of every legal loophole. They shift money overseas. They do the double Irish. They, you know, give little bits of money to charity, you know, to their Google News initiative. Then they cut that back. They didn't want to do copyright. I mean, I feel like the story of big tech is they would say, well, sure, regulation's great. Just not that one. And then by the time they've ruled out everything, you're like, okay, what exactly do you want to do? So sure, you know, if they've been willing to pay taxes fair and square and, you know, earmark it for small outlets or BIPOC outlets, like whatever, great. But they spent years not doing anything. So I think the fact that they, you know, under this code, they did start paying is really, really important. And then on the transparency thing, yes, I think I do feel differently than Rod, because I have so many conversations around the world where people just have really no idea, you know, so if you go to South Africa, you're hearing they're being offered, I don't know, $20,000 a year, or in South America, Google's coming in and saying, you know, we'll give you a few hundred thousand dollars a year. So I do think a lot of, a lot of publishers are just flying blind um, around the world. And so some form of transparency, I mean, when we had the meeting in Johannesburg last summer, you know, we had several principles. I'm sorry, Rod probably won't agree with all of them, but, you know, transparency for sure, a commitment that the money is going to go to news. So not our situation in the US where we have all these hedge funds that have just bought up news outlets. We don't really want it to go to salaries for the, you know, whatever, the president of the hedge fund. Um, and then also, I do think some sort of commitment to, to sharing it. Um, as well. So those would be my modifications, but I still think the bargaining code has been the best thing around. You Can know? I just jump in and say we have made public that um, the payments were roughly equal to 25% of the cost, the full costs of, of each journalist. So at least there's a benchmark out there, Anya, that people in Africa or wherever could understand the Australian system generated about 20%, 25% of the cost of each journalist employed. So a bit of a benchmark's out there. I accept, though, that's coming from the ACCC voluntarily putting that out there, and that's why I think something that 
came from a government authority that said, here's the total and maybe here's the amount on average paid per per journalist employed would be helpful and would give good good guidance. So I didn't even know that. And that's so useful. I'm going to start quoting it. And then, of course, we'll have to have another conversation later where you can explain to me what happens in countries where journalists aren't really paid very much, you know, Mm -hmm. how how we would adapt that. So I'll definitely ask you about that offline for sure. But that's great. to know, And thank you. One problem at a time, I think, Anya, that uh, uh, our journalists probably argue they aren't paid very much either, but uh, I'm sure way more than the countries you're talking about. Well, a lot, of, a lot of the public would argue journalists are paid too much if they're paid at all. Um, Anya, let's um, let's go to your research then, which is um, fascinating about the value of news. So as a bit of disclosure for me, I spent part of the development of this code as a consultant with a colleague, Karen Lee, to the Public Interest Journalism Initiative, um, helping draft their submissions into the whole process. And one of the most difficult issues that kept arising was what is the value of news? What is news worth full stop? And then what is it worth to digital platforms? And your research is right on that question. Absolutely. So um, I'll start by saying I'm not an economist, but I worked with a team of economists. And like you, I sat in so many rooms where journalists said, gee, how do we value news? What are we owed? Is it harm? Is it eyeballs? Is it clicks? Is it adverts? And I knew that journalists didn't have to worry about this because actually there are economists who specialize in this kind of work. So I found um, a group called Brattle, which specializes in reparations. They work a lot on big tech and also um, a colleague at Columbia called Harris Mateen. And then um, they all agree to put in their time to figure out this problem. And then I started looking around the world and asking everybody, well, how, how have you valued news? And it turned out that in some places like in the US, the Publishers Association had commissioned studies with economists, but weren't releasing the numbers because they were using that information to go and make private one-on-one deals with Google. So I sort of looked around all over the place, called up everybody I could think of, and then, um, and spoke to some of the people who'd done these studies. And then, and of course, if Google and Facebook gave out figures, we wouldn't even have this problem. So that's the first thing. I mean, it's kind of crazy. I've spent all this time trying to extrapolate when they have all the information and they should just share it to begin with. Um, But one, one thing that did make a difference was we found in Switzerland, a behavioral economics firm, which is run by one of the top behavioral economists in the world. And they did a randomized control trial where they created a Google with no news. And then they measured the behavior of people on that Google with the Google, regular Google with news. And what they found was that without news, people didn't really want to use Google very much. Um, And so from there, they extrapolated what percent of search is news related. Now, Google goes around the world saying that only 2% of search is directly news related. And that seems bonkers. Actually, people I know who work at Google don't even believe it. Um, Because pretty much when you're looking for information, you know, sometimes you want to find a hairdresser or a place to eat, but usually you want to know what's happened recently. So the 2% is ridiculous. And um, so the economists that I'm working with spent a few months on this and they came back And they said, actually, in the U.S., Google probably owes something like 13 billion. Facebook owes, I don't know, two or three billion. And the total number is like 15 billion dollars owed to publishers in the U.S. And honestly, that number scared us so much that I said to them, I'm sorry, we can't really publish that. You have to go back and do it again. So they went back and did it again. And they still came up with roughly most conservatively $13 $13 billion are owed by Google and, and Facebook to US um, outlets. And I will tell you, I feel uncomfortable talking about this, but if you look, you will notice that not one single mainstream news outlet has covered our paper. Because, um, and I, I don't know why that is, um, but I what I will say is that in the US, and everywhere in the world, Google has given, made arrangements with the large outlets. 
Um, and so it's really one of the reasons I've, I've gotten so interested in the subject is because I think that people have gotten much less money than they should have. And the small outlets have been excluded. That's fascinating, Anya. Fascinating. That that figure is astronomical, and and I understand why you were scared when it was first um, when you first heard it. So we're somewhere in the vicinity of eleven billion for Google and two billion conservatively for Meta, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, uh, astounding figures. How how do you respond um, uh, to to Anya and, and her research, but also to this larger question about you know how do we value news and specifically news to the news the value of news to digital platforms. And I just want to say one other thing is that part, um, part of this theory was built on you know 50 years of game theory, that when you think about this problem, you have to think about the surplus that is created by both sides working together. So publishers benefit and the platforms benefit. And so then the question is, how do you divide that surplus? And that's the sort of starting point for how the team thought about this problem. Uh, yeah, that's, gee, it's really, really interesting. Uh, look, I, um, not sure I buy that methodology. Well, I, I must look into that paper. It sounds fascinating, but I don't think it's a simple question of saying, uh, look, what's the revenue of these guys and how much traffic do we get? Well, we'll, we'll take that percentage. Um, I think that that kind of misrepresents or rather forgets about the reality of how power has shifted to digital platforms across the spectrum and not just um, in regards to news. So I, I think saying that, well, we're owed X percent because we drive X percent of their engagement uh, misunderstands the power balance between um, digital platforms and content publishers. And um, you can say that's unjust. Well, whatever. It's actually just a a a, a key um, aspect of modern digital life is that um, digital platforms are always going to have um, a power imbalance over people who contribute to them. Um, and you know, this this is the reason um, that Rod and his crew were brought in to um, you know correct the situation because that imbalance is is patent. So, uh, so now the question of, um, uh, I, I, I wanted to go back to the question of fairness because I don't see fair being quite the right word here. Um, I don't think that it's a question of whether or not the bargaining code is fair. Um, as I said, I don't particularly care about the digital um, platforms. Um, I think the question is, does the bargaining code in Australia represent a rational and um, kind of sound value exchange between publishers and platforms. I don't think that it does in what it purports to do explicitly because it it says that, or I think it says that the the platforms are paying for um, access to that content, like the ability to index it, the ability to link to it. Um, and I would have loved if someone had been designated under the Australian code, um, which didn't happen because, and, and it went to arbitration because then we would actually have an expl explicit valuation of, uh, of news. And we would have been able to air those questions of, okay, exactly how valuable is this content to the digital platforms? Um, I think that the meta and Google, and remember we're only talking about two specific um, companies here, I think they're quite different. Uh, and I think that's why we're seeing their diverging reactions to this kind of legislation around the world. I think that uh, it really, news really doesn't matter to matter that much, or rather it does matter, but it's become such a pain in the ass that they would rather walk away entirely. And they can do that because I really do believe it is a minor part of their business. Um, and I think we've seen quite publicly the dalliance that uh, Mark Zuckerberg has had with news through these last, you know, seven years or so. Uh, and he no longer wants any part of it. That organization really doesn't want any part of it. They have sacked all of their news people in all around the world. They're um, retracting. They're retracting from news. 
Now, it is really interesting, the research that Anya is talking about, because it implies that Google is much more um, enmeshed with news. And I think that's right. I think they also have a commitment and a, they're wedded to the open web. And the open web is, news is a big part of that. News is a kind of a lifeblood flowing through its veins. I don't think news is as central as the news media think that it is. <laughs> you know, we're all obsessed with what we do. Um, but things like recipes, academic papers, um, blogs, uh, photographs, all of this sort of stuff, YouTube, uh, this accounts for the vast bulk of um, internet traffic and engagement. And I, I do think that news is quite a small part of everyday people's engagement with digital content. I think it's incredibly important. Um, I think that we need to find a way of financing it. I just don't think that uh, the way that it's been characterized uh, and the way that we forced these guys to pay at the moment is is correct. Um, and I think that's why they're trying to weasel out of it because they actually don't feel that they're good in good value. I don't, I, I think put it I this think way, sorry, I mean, no, you go, I'll, I'll shut up. Um, okay. I yeah, think, I mean, first of all, by the way, I completely agree with you. This is not a permanent solution and it may just be a couple of years of, of money. So absolutely right. But I think they're trying to weasel out of it because they don't, not because they don't think it's fair, but I think because they don't want to pay. And it's a little bit of a mystery to me because they have so, so, so much money. But the fact that they're fighting this so hard and in ways that really aren't very nice. I mean, you know that they're being investigated for what they did in Brazil last May, where they changed the search box so that when people would type in a query, they would get a message from Google saying this new law will ruin the Internet. And by the way, when I said, when I wrote about that, they insisted on a correction within like minutes of the piece appearing. So they're, they're playing very, very tough. And I don't, I don't think they are people that think about fairness, particularly how, and yeah. It, it I, I don't think if they say, if we said, oh, it's only 6%, they would suddenly yeah. say, okay, that's great. We're handing over money to everyone in the world. That's, that's not what they're doing. What they're, they're threatening yeah. people. They're hiring lobbyists and then yeah, they're yeah. making I'm not direct that, secret payments. Of course. I, I think they are incentivized to absolutely get payments down to a total minimum. And yes, um, that is is what we're seeing. And I think that they're paying money because they think it's the it's the path of least resistance in uh the case of Google. Um, I think it would be fascinating to hear Rod Rod's take on this now that he has more distance um from the ACCC. Um, I think that the choice to use competition law um, to to make them pay somehow, um, basically that decision at the very inception of that decision, it sort of said, okay, well, it 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 laid out how it could work in certain ways. It set the constraints. So the you know the, the in Australia's case, the die was cast right then and there because it was thought, okay, this is the way that we could make it work. And I will concede that one of the one of the great um, positive examples coming out of this is that it is possible to get digital giants to do something using national legislation. Um, prove that that's a case in point. It 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 did something. It actually got a result. Um, I just don't think that characterizing that as paying for links makes sense because I think if we had got to arbitration, a fair uh, arbiter would may have decided that there was a null value exchange there because the value that the publishers got out of the traffic coming from the link was as much as the uh, as the, the platform got, or you know. Either it it might not cancel it out entirely, but it may not be the the big numbers that the news industry was hoping for. Rod, I don't know if you want to respond to any of those. There are a lot of point, points raised there, including details about Anya's research. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to respond. Yeah, look, first of all, um, sorry, Hal, but we did not use competition law. Um, we were asked to do an inquiry by the government. Uh, yes, that gave a bias in the sense that we came up with the with focusing on the imbalance in bargaining power but then we recommended new legislation 
Uh, so there's no nothing in competition law that that we used at all. We used economic logic as to why we thought the law should be put there, and the imbalance in bargaining power was that logic. But then it's it's absolutely new legislation. It's got nothing to do with our competition law. It's it, it's just basically a government policy. We recommended it, yes. Um, where uh, a comp- I mean, the ATR- I'm not there anymore. I left 18 months ago. But the ACCC is a enforces competition law. It enforces consumer law. It regulates telecommunications, water, transport. Very broad organisation, possibly the broadest organisation in the world in terms of the regulatory coverage. Uh, we also do product safety. When I say we, I can't stop saying we, but uh, out of there for 18 months. Uh, but when the government asks us to do an inquiry, they're wanting us to use our skills to give them policy advice. We used our skills, that came up with the bargaining imbalance, uh, and we gave that advice. Now, on the numbers, we did our own calculations as best we could. We had a range of numbers that we thought the numbers would come out at. Prior to the numbers or the contracts being negotiated, I was asked a lot publicly uh, what I thought the outcome should be. I said, you know, if the platforms just paid 5% of the cost of journalism, that would be ridiculous, uh, too low. If they paid 50% of the cost of journalism, that strikes me as a bit too high. And lo and behold, we came up with 25, you know, the, the, the contracts eventually came up with 25%. So it pretty much came in with where we hoped it would come in with all the analysis we were able to do. As Anya says, of course, we couldn't get any information out of Google and Facebook, so it's pretty hard. The arbitration, so we never, the whole point about the law is to even up the bargaining balance. So we thought the threat of arbitration would get the parties to settle the matter. Uh, By the way, had it gone to arbitration, the arbitration under our law, the result of that would have been confidential. That was in the legislation. That was our recommendation. Had it gone to arbitration, we came up with final offer arbitration because we felt that given the lack of information from Google and Facebook, an arbitrator, if faced with normal commercial negotiation, Google and Facebook would have said what Hell said, which is the answer is zero. the news media companies were publicly saying the answer is about a billion. Uh, arbitrator just did not have the information to work that out. There was just, you know, we didn't have it, they didn't have it. So we said, well, if it goes to arbitration, it's final offer. What that means is each side puts in its best view. Neither side can be silly because if they're silly and the other side's sensible, it'll go with the other side's view. So we were really wanting the parties to sort this out. Commercial negotiation was our first preference. We got that, so we're very happy. Had it gone to arbitration, the final offer nature of it would have brought the parties together. But it's given the lack of information that Anya mentions, it's really hard to know what the right number is. In my view, we had a commercial negotiation. All the media companies were happy with it. Google and Facebook didn't carry out any threat, carry out threats that they were made. They didn't take it to arbitration. So they were not terribly unhappy. So whether it's, it's certainly in the band of an appropriate number. Now, Anya's number is, I think on my rough calculations, probably comes to, in Australian terms, about four times what Australian publishers were paid. I I've told Anya, I think that number looks a little on the high side, but I think it's fantastic having it out there because the methodology's there, right? So for the first time, we've got methodology coming up with a number. If you don't like the methodology, if you think the 50-50 is not right, then you can adjust it and you've got some basis for doing so. So I'm delighted the research is there. It's about four times more, but as I say, the media companies are happy. So to me, if you have a negotiation and both sides are happy, I'm happy. Thank you all. This uh, fascinating. Um, look, you, we've we've circled around designation a few times here, and that is one of the interesting parts of this 
this code. Um, it's really interesting, this piece of legislation, where there's a lot of detail, including a lot of minimum standards that would be imposed on digital platforms. But these minimum standards are only imposed if the digital platform is designated and no digital platform is designated because as the legislation specifies, they've made significant contributions to journalism. So it's it's uh, a little bit complicated. And Rod, as you say, you're very happy with the way this is all played out. So the matter has been settled by these commercial deals. Um, but let's just imagine um, a scenario of designation. Well, I guess the question is, do you think designation would be a good thing? Would it be preferable? But also I want to dig into some of those minimum standards quite specifically. So let's start with the professional standards for news organisations. So had designation happened, had uh, final offer arbitration been enforced, um, news media businesses would have had obligations too. And for them, they would have had to uh, sign up to a professional standards scheme, which we at the Centre for Media Transition think is a good idea because it would have hopefully brought journalism up to a higher standard. Um, Rod, I'll start with you. Do you... Um, is there a part of you that would love to see more of a, a, a an impetus on improving journalism that's tied to the money that that is given under the code? Basically, no, because we wanted commercial deals done. We think that's much the best, better outcome. You don't have much government fingerprints over this. Uh, there's always a negative when government gets involved. The standards we had in mind under the News Media Bargaining Code were ones that reputable media companies could easily meet. Now, I know there's obviously polarised views on media. There's people who hate one side of the media and people who hate the other side of the media. Uh, I run into these people all the time. And so if you hate one side, you think they're not up to standard. But I think any standard you would draft that would pass the mustard would uh the 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 main media companies would qualify i don't think there's any doubt about that so i don't think you I, you know if you think about all the media companies we've got in australia and courtesy of the digital revolution we've got way more now i mean our we've got a much more balanced media scene than we had before you can still say it's too concentrated i no no problem but you know you think about Obviously, we've got News Limited, we've got the ABC, um, which now, the ABC is now a newspaper because, you know, if you want to read um, News Limited, not many people either buy the newspaper or flick through the digital edition, which is what I do. They just go on the website. Well, the ABC is the number one news website in Australia. Uh, the Guardian I think is about fifth or sixth. They keep telling me they're higher than that, but still they're doing really well. Uh, and then, of course, you've got nine, you've got seven. Um, and people forget how powerful those organisations are. Nine not only has the number one or two TV station, it's got the only financial paper, it's got the only broadsheet in Melbourne and Sydney, and, of course, it's got the number one commercial radio station right across the country. So nine... ABC, News Limited, they're all very powerful. Seven is more powerful in the West, but they've got websites that apply throughout the country. And then The Guardian, of course, which is this upstart that walks in, yes, with the backing of the UK, but it's doing really well. But so is, you know, you've got the New Daily, you've got, when I wanted to find out what was going on in the Olympics, the best coverage was in the New Daily, because I used to send out missives to the C every day on what everybody should watch because the Olympics were running during our times. And so we'd interrupt our meetings to watch particular sporting events. That was one of the things I decreed. Uh, and I got most of that off the New Daily. So there's, you know, there's a whole lot of Saturday paper, the whole Maury Schwartz empire, you know, they didn't exist before. So uh, crikey, the rest of it. Um, and in, in short, you're not, there's, you see no um, downside really to the lack of designation. No, I don't. I, I think we, we saw arbitration as the threat. In the end, it became designation. And keep in mind, most of the deals were done within about six months because they had to move fast. Had we gone designation, arbitration, the cases would still be running through now, right? 
you whereas we had money flowing within six months so i think this was all i mean for us it was about commercial deals uh the government legislation was the way to even up the bargaining power to get those commercial deals uh we got them success digital uh, it turned out designation was all part of the thing they wanted to avoid. That's fine. Mm. I'm sorry. I'll just say one other thing. If you yeah. want to improve press standards, then that I think is a law in itself. I, I do think though, you would find it really hard. You know, I, I think you'd get the government would get criticized for interfering with the press in a way that it would not do. So I just think, I don't think there was any mileage to be gained through that direction. Yeah, thank you. Um, Hal, I, I guess I've wrapped up two issues there. So regulation of the press, press standards, um, and also designation. Um, do you have any thoughts on those? Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, I think that the professional standards question uh, is not um, something that I care too much about. I think that um, it's quite easy to uh, adopt a um, professional standard for your organization and the proof is in the pudding. Um, obviously there was a requirement to have some kind of oversight body. Um, you know, there's plenty of reporting by organizations that people don't like and regard as poor quality, even in organizations that have oversight bodies. So look, I, to me, that's neither here nor there. I think, um, there's a couple of revolutionary aspects of, um, the code that I would have loved to see in action, um, which would have happened if there was designation and arbitration. Um, notice of algorithmic changes um, would have been amazing, um, un unprecedented. We do know that that, that arbitrary changes to uh, algorithms absolutely uh, have devastated news businesses in the past. Um, so that would have been uh, interesting and good. Not sure if it would have made a fundamental change to the way that news, um, to the fortunes of news. Um, but the last one, the uh, requirement for platforms to take steps to surface original reporting would actually have been revolutionary if the platforms had taken it seriously. I mean, it's still an option open to them, but this is going to be going forward one of the issues in journalism. And uh, who um, owns information? Well, as we know, no one owns information and it doesn't fall under the auspices of the copyright um, of copyright law, mostly. Um, only the form of stuff falls under copyright usually. And um, with AI, I think it's one of your later subjects, This the, the issue of the provenance of information is going to become incredibly important. It would have been really cool if there was upweighting in um, uh, digital platform algorithms to, uh, you know, to enforce the uh, upweighting of people who originate information as opposed to those who just copy it super cheap. Um, and that could have been revolutionary. So that um, it, it's, it's a shame that we didn't get a chance to sort of work on any of that stuff. Mm, thanks. Sorry, Sorry, Bob. Sorry, Bob. Uh, yeah. Just, just very quickly. We engaged with Google, particularly to some extent Meta, on notice of algorithm changes, on surfacing original content. The more we talked it through, it's just really hard. Um, it's hard to put a requirement in there that, it, you know, it's either so onerous you're causing other problems or it's less onerous and it doesn't really work and they can get around it. So all I'd say back to hell is we thought about it really hard. And in the end, look, better brains could probably work it out. And, you know, we had a lot on our plate. We were doing a lot of things, but we couldn't see anything that would actually make a big contribution. So in the end, we didn't put a lot of value on those things. But look, if someone can find a way to do it, that's terrific. I mean, what's original content is really hard. We all know there's media organizations that, take a story, interview one other person, put it in the story, and then they think it's their story when it's someone else's story. How do you deal with that? Mm. Um, I don't know. So mm. love to do it, Hell, I just don't see how. Yeah, it would be, it's quite. It's going to be quite ironic when the solution to that problem is AI. Um, <laughs> 
because I, I agree. Like when you think about it, it is getting getting into the the nitty gritty of uh, who owns information. And I, I hope, yes, you know, as a society, we don't go down that um, don't go down that route because you know you can't report on that because I reported on it first. Well, that's not going to work. Um, but I just thought, yeah, it would be great if there was a way. Um, seeing as we have found a mechanism to strong arm platforms. Uh, if we can use a mechanism um, to strong arm them into something that would, uh, let's say, systemically encourage original reporting, it would be amazing. Mm. I agree um, with you. All, but they... I, I just want to say, I think I'm, I'm really glad that you're talking about generative AI and large language models, because I think that's even more important. Um, the need for, I think the codes are really important now when we think about this in the future. And it's going to be the same problem all over again, where we see that open AI is already starting to give sort of PR money to different organizations. And I think that um, journalists, you know, I've been saying, especially like Spanish language, Portuguese, it's really important to band together and try to negotiate with the with the um, with the large language model companies and open AI. I think it's going to be a real problem. And from what I understand, they're already hiring people to quote unquote, write news stories so they can say that it's their material. So I think, I think things are about to get a lot worse. These are enormous issues um, and they transcend the code really, of course, you know, the surfacing of original content, um, the oversight of algorithms um, and, you know, Europe, they're grappling with them with the AI Act, where there's just been some movement over the past couple of weeks, um, the Digital Services Act and, and so on. So speaking about AI, you know, let's go to that big contentious topic. Um, you know, as we get something like ChatGPT and ChatGPT scrapes the web and uses all sorts of sources to generate its outputs, including news stories, should AI content, um, should ChatGPT um, also come under the code um, and should... Uh, the companies that have these generative AI models also be subject to a similar mechanism. Rod, what do you think? Well, I think they should. Uh, I haven't thought through how that would happen, but I think if you've got something like the code, let's see whether we could bring generative AI within that code. That seems to me to be the first step of thinking. If for some reason it can't be, then we need to come up with something else. Generative AI... Um, as Anya said, is a real threat to journalism. It can grab the information. Uh, you've got additional worries that it can make up information. I mean, it can get the wrong information. So it's uh, at least Google is accessing information straight from the media sites. Generative AI is just gathering information all around and who knows where it ends up. So I'm a proponent of strong regulation of AI, people say to me, well, won't that slow it down? I say, I don't care. I think the worry is that it'll get out of control and change our society in ways we're not ready for yet. So I think government has got to begin the journey and it is a journey because we don't know how to do it. And that's why I think the European AI Act is fantastic. Just like I think the Digital Services Act is fantastic. They're starting a journey. They're not the end point but they're engaging with these platforms, they're dealing with problems, they're learning as they go, and that's the right way to do it. And I think all other countries should do the same. Anya, what, did, what do you think on that issue? Yeah, no, 100%. I very much agree. Um, and as I as I mentioned, they're already, you know, trying to find ways not to pay for content. Um, we're, we're having a lot of, I'm sure it's the same in Australia, but there's a lot of lawsuits in the US now from writers who've seen their work suddenly appearing. Um, OpenAI, I think is supposed to have a billion dollars of revenue this year, but they're going to say, well, we're money losing, we can't, we can't pay out. But since our paper, um, we put we posted our paper a few weeks ago, we've had nonstop phone calls from or emails from different publishers, associations and governments around the world. And that's the question on everyone's mind. How are we going to use this to negotiate and get some fun funds for the journalism that's being used in the large language models? So I think it's a critical question. Um, and obviously putting a, you know, paywall doesn't stop doesn't stop the use of the material. So uh, I think, yeah, I think everyone's really worried about it right now. Mm, Hal? Yeah, um, 
you may be surprised. Yeah, the other two guys may be surprised that I'm. Um, I, I think that that the case for um, AI large language models to compensate the news industry if they use their material is is practically watertight. I don't know exactly uh, on you know how do you how do you pick it apart and a- allocate money, but news wouldn't exist if it were possible for someone else to automatically paraphrase it and then profit from the paraphrasing of that of that news. So that can't work. That doesn't work. And it's, and it's not fair either. Um, and so the news industry in its entirety would be totally undermined, um, if that were to come to pass. So there definitely has to be some, some sort of compensation there, but it does go back uh, again to that, um, tough nut that we talked about before, which is provenance of original reporting. Um, because in allocating money, say, um, it, it seems that large language models may largely supplant a lot of Google search activity, not all of it, but all of the stuff where people are asking for advice or um, tell me what happened today, all of that m- may be taken over by large language models. And in that case where there is no link back to a publisher and therefore no benefit, um, no, you know, no, no value ex- from that, from that exchange, there has to be a method of one compensating and two working out who needs to be compensated. So yeah, I think it's 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 a massive issue. Thank you. Well, look, um, time is getting on. Let's come finally to overseas jurisdictions. Um, uh, there's a lot happening. Um, it's a long list of countries. Uh, Rob, I'll start with you. You know, can you can you take us some of the through some of the conversations you've had with other jurisdictions um, and some, I guess, some of the ways that they're they're using the Australian code as a basis or diverging from it? Yeah, so the Canadian law automatically designated Google and Facebook and that meant that they were caught up in things they didn't want to get caught up in. We, with our code, gave them a chance to get out of those things by just doing the bargaining and doing a deal. So I wasn't that comfortable with automatic designation. I obviously preferred our approach. But having said that, they seem to have reached a deal with Google and obviously met as a different matter. So that's success. Uh, there's, we're not, I mean, Anya's a better place than I am, but the, the JCPA in the US seems stuck, although the Californians seem to be doing things. The British if they get their special market services regime up, I think we'll probably do something very similar to the Australian model. And then as Anya said, you've got, well, I don't know which one she mentioned, but uh, you've got Indonesia, India, and so forth. The only concern I've got with them, which Anya's heard me make before, is that they're, they're, they're taking our code as a starting point and then loading up extra obligations. And my worry with that is that that will cause a backlash um, they may not be worth those extra obligations may not be worth much. Those extra obligations may be things that cause Google to leave the country. So I think they're by taking what we did as a starting point, not a finishing point, and, and trying to load in extra things, it, it may backfire. So that's my concern. But it's great that can I, that that we have a model in Canada up. So now we've got it in two countries. Wonderful if we can get California up. That's the size of a country anyway. Uh, so uh, a bit of momentum there, I think, is fantastic. Well, the Canadian law um, was passed in the middle of the year. If I've got my dates right, I think it comes into effect next week. Um, and as you say, Google just made a deal, uh, which in its entirety is for $100 million, Canadian dollars. Um, Meta, by complete contrast, has taken news from its platforms. So, you know, we can see there their intentions there. Anya, what what are some of your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely the publisher should have gotten more in Canada, but Google is incredibly powerful and they throw their weight around and they don't play nicely. So people are getting cheated. And um, what I'm seeing around the world is that Google is managing to jeopardize these laws in many places. And um, 
making direct pay, you know, by making direct payments to publishers is one is one of the tactics. It, they do a very good job of sort of splitting the class and um, dividing and conquering. So, um, so I don't know how many more of these laws we're going to see, you know, again, places like South Africa, people are desperate, they're going to take money right now if they can get it. So, um, yeah, so even though I think these laws are great, I think the reality is one of the effects of our paper, the Australian law is at least it's helping people get a little money. Well, and of uh little. Yeah, I don't think I know as much as, as these other guys about the international situation. I, I would note that the uh, Online News Act in Canada has sort of devolved into something that is quite different from the Australian situation in that we've got just one mob, um, Google, contributing $100 million Canada dollars to Canadian dollars to a fund that is then going to be distributed um, by a news... The, a, a news body, um, effectively by the number of full-time journos that there are in your designate, designated news organization. So that starts to look an awful like a lo awful lot like a subsidy. Um, if you've got a hundred million bucks divided up by a certain formula. So yeah, that's just a just an observation that I've, I I believe that the Canadians have run into a contradiction and that's how they're, they're dealing with it. Um, just a comment, um, Meta, um, it seems pretty clear that unless they're just bluffing into, well, I think they're going to walk away from renewing deals here. I They have walked away in Canada. Um, could be they're just bluffing in two markets and or it could be that they really don't care about news. I think it's the latter. I don't think they care about news or I think they want done with it. Um, so I think for them, at least, the answer of, so what's the value exchange? They've answered it with their actions. Just to jump in. Let's yeah, just... please do. I think it's no coincidence at all that um, news feed for Facebook is now just the feed. Um, Rod, please do. But, well, well, it means that every time, so if I'm a Facebook user, uh, and I've got a lot of friends and I notice an article in a media company and I want to send that to my friends, Facebook's got to take it right down. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing in Canada. That's not very friendly towards their users. Uh, I get people sending me media comments all the time, not via Facebook, usually via old fashioned technology called SMS, uh, which I think find works really well, actually. So whether this is sustainable for Facebook to be telling their users there's a whole range of things they can't do, I think time will tell. So it's not obvious. I mean, I understand what Hell is saying. Facebook have been adamant they don't care about trusted news. They're not in the trusted news business. They're in the over-the-fence gossip business. Uh, and, of course, they're about family connections and local clubs and things like that. But they're not there to... Provide. I mean, interesting, they used to call their feed the news feed, which, of course, we made a big play on, so they changed that to just the feed. But it's not a feed if you can't feed anything in you want to to your friends. You, you can't feed in news stories. You can't tell them, I've just seen this great story. So I let's see what Meta actually do. It, it's a big call on their part to restrict their users from not even being able to post a news item Absolutely. Look, let's wrap it up there. But Rod, I wanted to just as a final point, I mean, I imagine this came at towards the end of your time at the ACCC. It really is, you know, whether you love it or hate it, it's a, an enormous piece of work, this code. Um, it is world first. It is very innovative and it's had uh, really far reaching repercussions and impact. How do you reflect on this, on the code personally, in terms of, of your time at the ACCC and your career? Is that something you're really proud of? Yes, it is uh, a few range of things. Uh, a range of things I'm proud of, but yes, I, I can't not be really. It was very successful. It's had a lot of world attention. Uh, so yes, I, I'd be misleading if I said anything other than the fact that I am proud of it. Yes. Great. Well, look, thank you, Rod. Rod Sims, thank you very much for being here. Anya Schifrin, Hal Crawford, I really appreciate your time. Um, that's double take. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, anyone who's watching or listening, you can subscribe to Double Take on your favorite 
podcast app. Um, we'll be back next year with another episode. This is the last one for 2023. Um, you can find us on the social media that you use um, or Rod can SMS you, um, various links. Um, our handle is CMT underscore UTS. I'm Sasha Molotoris. Thank you very much for listening or watching. Thanks, Sasha. <laughs>